Um, may I call you Richard? Yes. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, have a chance to have a conversation with Richard Wilson. Um, Richard, when and where were you born? Born in Cardiff um, in 1942. I was actually technically born in Glamorgan uh, because my mother had me in the midwife's home. She, she, and when, before she died she, many years ago, she said, I want to show you where you were born. So we drove around and then she said, oh, no, no, this is the wrong road. And then uh, she never, we, she didn't know where it was. <laughs> so I'm not absolutely certain where I was born, but the, my birth certificate says Rubina in the district of Caerphilly in the county of Glamorgan in, 1940, uh, in October 1942. Uh, and we, my uh, parents moved to um, Cardiff. They, from, they had been living north of Newport. Um, in South Wales. Uh, they moved to Cardiff. My father was called up in the RAF in, in 1942 and uh, my mother followed him and rented this house. Uh, and then of course he was sent overseas so she found herself in the middle of Cardiff uh, which is being bombed uh, and, um, and, and, and no, no family near about. Um, and my sister, I had two sisters, uh, one who was ten years older than me and one who was eight and a half years older than me. And they had been sent to Mid Wales out of for boarding school because of the war. And my eldest sister, who is a strong personality, came home to help my mother look after me. Uh, and um, my earliest memories, if that's of any relevance, yes, it is. are of fear, um, interestingly. Uh, now, and there is a, I was debating with Gabriel Hall the other day uh, quite how much one can remember and how soon. But I do have memories which seem to me both genuine uh, and very early, and ones that no one else could have told me about. Uh, and basically they were fear of aircraft overhead. Uh, I can remember being in a cot and, and hearing aircraft and being very frightened. It's the fear I most remember. I also can remember being taken under a table. We had a very large oak dining table. Uh, we, we went under it, uh, I think, during air raids. And I can remember seeing the ceiling uh, with cracks in it and a man coming to advise my mother on whether it was going to come down, or presumably. But I can just remember that they looked like spiders with the sort of uh, um, uh, the cracks around the ceiling. So, and I can remember bands passing and being pretty worried about them and disliking sirens. And these are all things that I don't think anyone else would tell me. So anyway, that's, so it was a, it was a fairly, um, uh, it was a wartime existence. Um, tell, me, tell me about um, your further back relatives, if, you, if they had any influence or you knew them at all, your grandparents, for example. Well, I didn't, I, uh, my parents came from two pretty modest middle-class families in South Wales. Um, my uh, grandfather on my mother's side had come down from Scotland uh, and started a, a store in Newport and then he moved on and had a small firm uh, manufacturing company at the base of Newport Transporter Bridge. And my um, grandmother, the only one, I, I never knew that grand, I never knew either grandfather, but that grandmother on my mother's side, my maternal grandmother had been from, uh, born into uh, a, a family which is slightly one up on that. She was, uh, but uh, she was, um, had been sent to New Quay in West Wales. They came, fundamentally they came from West Wales uh, and she only spoke Welsh for the first few years of her life. Um, and when she married my uh, grandfather who is in business, she was told by her mother that uh, she would not be able to mix socially with her sisters because they had married into professional uh, class. Uh, her, so her sister Myra, who married a man called Dr. James, uh, was, lived in a rather smart house in the middle of Newport. And um, my grandmother was told, well, I don't think it's true, that they couldn't mix. In incidentally, you asked me about background. That, uh, those grandparents, those great, un great aunt and her husband, James, uh, were the grandparents of William Rushton, who was a, mm. a television star, yes, Bill course. Rushton, mm. uh, and who was a few years older than me. 
and whose uh, clothes used to come to me second hand. <laughs> and I used to stand there festooned. He was, a large he, was, man, he, was a, he was much larger than me and I was a thin <laughs> child. And I used to, my mother used to put on these cricketing sweaters which would sort of droop <laughs> off me. Uh, and, um, but anyway, that's another, I may come to that. And um, that, so that's that side of the family. My father's side of the family uh, had a strong church background. Uh, and uh, my grandfather was a solicitor. Uh, his, and uh, my grandmother, Nellie Lloyd, uh, had been, uh, came from a family which had owned the, the, a very large coaching inn in the middle of Newport. Uh, and um, my father uh, was, uh, became a lawyer. He, neither of my parents went to university. My father became a lawyer. In, in, he's, my father was born in 1903, my mother in 1904. Both were Edwardian children, and some of the flavour of Edwardian England lingered through into my upbringing. Uh, my father became a solicitor uh, and then was called up in the RAF. Uh, and uh, after the war, if I may just resume that mm -hmm. narrative, uh, they moved back to north of Newport, a place called Flantarnum, not much more than the hamlet, very close to a new town, as it was later to be called Cumbran, uh, where we went, to, before it became a new town, we used to go there to get my orange juice, which I, I, which I, I don't know when you were born. Was it in, yes, well, I was a year older than you. Yeah, well, you remember mm -hmm. orange juice, mm -hmm. I don't know. And um, my father resumed his practice, I think it's a very grim period, those post-war years. Mm -hmm. I think business was pretty slim, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we just about scraped through, and I went to school in Newport, uh, until the age of eight. Um, before, before you go on to that, your parents' character, what, what were they like as people? You say they weren't university, but... They were not, not university, they were... Um, they were shy, they were socially... Uh, my father was, didn't make friends easily. Uh, my mother was, I, had, had, had very little education. Uh, I, I don't really know how, what she, she didn't ever seem to have gone to school except for one year at, uh, in London. Um, and my grandmother, had, her mother, had been a hugely spirited lady. She had been, she'd wanted to be a doctor and to go out to the Boer War and her parents wouldn't let her. So she, and she trained a bit as a nurse and then she became a suffragette in hmm. Newport and the suffragettes had an office on Stowe Hill in Newport. Uh, and um, my mother always told it in a rather jokey manner. She said that she retired as a suffragette because she sat on a croquet needle and got a nasty flesh wound. But I don't know. <laughs> so, but they used to have discussions. I can remember my grandmother telling me about how they used to discuss when they were going to commit a crime. And that she had a very close friend who was going to put a brick through a window somewhere and chose to do it in August because she was a keen gardener. Uh, and uh, August is the least interesting month in the garden, the least <laughs> to do. So, I mean, uh, uh, my grandmother was very, had a, had a marvellous spirit. Um, and um, she was the only, uh, uh, the other, both grandparent fathers died before I was born. Uh, my father's mother died um, in about 1947. And I do remember her dimly, but not very well. Mm. Um, and so the only grandmother I really knew was the one, uh, my mother's mother. So, you're, you're, it sounds as if they were shy, self-effacing sort of people. They were very shy, self-effacing people. My father was hate, hated argument, which was uh, difficult, really, because I used to like argument. I used, <laughs> and I used to like saying things when I was a teenager to see what they sounded like. Mm. Um, and it, it was, it was that was. I mean, it was painful, really. Uh, my mother um, was a very bright woman who'd had, I think she's highly intelligent, but she had no self-confidence. Her father, I think, had been, was an extremely difficult man, um, and he had tried out every religion, including Christian science. She always remembered how, when she'd had um, some illness, like chickenpox or measles, he'd come in and thrown at her. Was it Mary Baker Edison? Mm, yes, that's right, Mary Baker Edison. Mary Baker Edison's book and said, mm. this is all in the mind, you must heal yourself. <laughs> and she'd felt distinctly aggrieved. Um, and uh, so she they had didn't, little... They didn't push you towards um, education or no. scholarly things? Well, this is what... They, 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 but they, they, I think, 
they wanted they, my father's education. He'd been to a private school in Western Supermare, mm. which he'd left when he was sixteen, and then he'd he'd done his solicitor's exams at whatever law school was mm. then going in the early must have been the, sort of around nineteen uh, late twenties. Um, and when I was about, I can't remember the year. It must have been in, somehow in the first half of the fifties. My father uh, sold his share in the solicitor's practice and became solicitor to the church in Wales. He'd always lingered around on the edges of the church um, and he became the registrar for a bit and then he became secretary of the church in Wales, which as you remember is independent of the state. Uh, and uh, he was kind of the most senior non-cleric in that church and he used to go off to a synod in, in North Wales every autumn. Uh, and the children, I, I mean, I used to play with his, the son of the Bishop of, uh, of Monmouth, and, you know, because people who lived in Newport. And, and uh, so he, and they used them, he used the money he got from selling his uh, practice to educate me. Uh, and I think my parents, although they wanted me to have a private education, they were very much at a loss as to they didn't know much about it, but they, they found a prep school in Western Supermare, um, which uh, was quite a, I mean, I think the 1930s went on a lot longer than the 1930s. <laughs> it was, a, it was, a, it's a school that was very well described by Roald Dahl in his book, Boy. There's a very good picture of it. It's, the school no longer exists, but there's a very good picture of it in the inside <laughs> cover of that book. And Dahl, I think was very cruelly lampooned the Latin classics master, Latin master, who was known as Capio, a man called Capio Lancaster, and I don't know why he's called Capio. I haven't talked about him for many years, but he, Capio appears in one of Earl Dahl's books. I got a, uh, and Dahl really couldn't bear the school. Dahl was at the same school. Dahl was at, he's a lot older than me, yeah. but Dahl was at that school, mm. um, and describes describes mm. some of the culture of the school. It was a very tough. It was quite a tough boarding school of that period, mm. uh, and um, uh, I didn't. I think for me, it was a huge shock. Mm. I'd been quite a, I think I was, it was very isolated be, living in Newport uh, or, or north of Newport. I had very, and I, it was, and I don't think my mother had the faintest notion what to do with me. Um, and I was on my own, I was on my own a great deal. Mm. Uh, and I used to like, I used to long I, for, um, I used to long for theatre. And when the pantomime came, or occasionally there'd be something by the Newport Light Opera Company, uh, I, that would, was the most marvellously, most exciting thing. And I always made myself ill and had to be taken out because I was sick. <laughs> it went on for years, having to be taken out of, uh, out of um, theatres. Because as soon as you got to the pantomime, you know, the, I can remember the Prince voice saying, you, I had to be taken out. I just felt <laughs> I was so ill, I got overexcited. Uh, and similarly, I used to love cinema, which is a very rare treat, but we used to occasionally go to cinema, and that was, was left me a, a lifetime's love of, of, of movies, to use mm. the modern phrase, but I used to love going to the cinema, mm. you know, and that would be my treat before going back to school. Did you have any hobbies at that time? No, I was, I was pathetically unhobbied. I learned <laughs> to play the piano at mm. the age of four, and I was reasonably competent at it without being exceptional. I played that till I left school at 18, uh, 17. Um, and I um, you collect things, or no, I didn't. I tried collecting things, but uh, that didn't work. The thing I I loved doing was reading, mm. and um, I used to read the most inappropriate things. Uh, but I, there were whatever books I could find in the house, mm. I would I'd read. I think I'd read everything. Mm. Mm. So I read all sorts of authors who people never read now, like <laughs> W. Harrison Ainsworth <laughs> uh, and. Um, Francis Brett Young mm. and W. W. Jacobs and mm. H. G. Wells and you know it's extraordinary to think of me at six or seven sitting there wading through Mr. Perrin and Mr. Trail and I look at some of the books now mm. that I read then I think how on earth did you possibly mm. do these read these things but anything that was around I sort of sort of swallowed up I learnt, taught myself to read very early I read I think taught myself when I was about three and I used to mm. sit there reading sort of awful books. There was a book about Odette in the war with, you know, I read, which one of my sisters had bought and I sort of, what they read I used to read. Mm. So Peter Cheney, one of my sisters mm. would bring home, read Peter Cheney. So it was very, so I, that was really, I think, the thing which, 
Those are the things which honestly turn me on. Mm. I'd like to say there were other things, but I, that would be untrue. Did you wear glasses when you were a child? No, no one noticed that I was very short-sighted. Uh, and I didn't know that it could be better. Mm. And one of the most revelatory moments of my life, when I was about... I was in the CCF at school, we're jumping right. forward yeah. a bit. Um, and we had a, a sort of training, cadet corps training mm. exam of some sort. And I, they asked me to focus a rifle, it was put a mm. rifle on a target, which is a, 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 a stone ball in, mm. on a wall. And I lay down, I couldn't see anything. And they said, but that's hopeless, try mm. again. And I couldn't begin, and I said I couldn't see it. And they began to realize that it wasn't, I wasn't just being thick or stupid. Mm. I simply couldn't see. So they had my eyes tested and found I was very short-sighted. And one of the most revelatory moments of my teenage life was walking out into the street with glasses on and discovering what it was like to see clearly. And but till then, I used to survive by going out to the blackboard after a class mm. and seeing what had been there. And mm. the, why I never noticed it myself, I don't know. It's uh, strange, isn't Very it? odd. Yes. But I, anyway, and I didn't like making a fuss because you didn't make a fuss. I was brought up not to make a fuss, so I didn't make a fuss. <laughs> and I just, and which explains why I was hopeless at cricket. Because mm. I used to think, how do people see the ball? Mm. It used to be, you know, I had no idea where it was. Yes. Very odd. Very odd. Well, we'll talk about it afterwards yes. because I have various views on the subject. But anyway. Yes. Um, okay, well, let's take you to this, uh, again, to this boarding school. Um, Tough, tough, but... Tough, but... But, I mean, I think I hated, I hated it. Oh, yes, I didn't fit in. I didn't know how to cope with it because I hadn't had yeah. that much experience mm. of, of fitting with others. And it was a school where, as always, through my whole of my education, sport mattered. Mm. Uh, and I was hopeless at it, as see previous conversation. Mm. I was also extremely thin and weedy mm. <laughs> and had no strength and, not, and was pretty dis uncoordinated. Mm. Um, and I, I used to... There were things I used to like, like... And then again, I used to sort of tear into books again. I have mm. books have been a huge support to me, mm. um, at various points in life. And I read well, completely indiscriminately. I read mm. all of Conan Doyle, all of um, P. G. Woodhouse, all of Leslie Charteris, The Saint, all of John Buchan, all of anything I could, you know, in the library. I used to find an author, and as it were drill into them until this I... This was at preparatory school. This is at prep school. I'm mm. talking about 8, mm. 9, 10, mm. 11, mm. that sort of age. Um, I, I, I've still got a lot of, well, a few actually, I've lost quite a lot now, of additions. Mm. Jerome K. Jerome, not just mm. Three Men in a Boat, but mm. uh, yeah, Idle Thoughts of an Idle Fennel, Three Men on a mm. Bummel. Mm. Quite a strong, so a lot of my upbringing, I think, had a strong Edwardian kind of the, the books of that period. Mm. Does that make any sense? Mm, it does, indeed. Yes. And, it was, and the prep school, I think, was quite sort of uh, uh, 1920s, 1930s, with mm. fights in the changing room, fist mm. fights in the changing beating? room. Beating? What? Beating, absolutely. Were you beaten? Yes, I was. But I was, so, I was a goody-goody. And I was so upset. I mean, I was a very good child. But um, I remember... We had a dormitory, and the boys, everyone else, was having pillow fights, and we'd all been warned not to. And the headmaster said, you must all come to my study in the morning. We were all beaten. And I mm. just thought, I still think it was extremely unfair, because mm. I was actually hating it all. <laughs> <laughs> were there any teachers at, at that school that you remember positively or...? Yeah, I think I was taught some things extremely well. Mm. There was a, a, a maths um, master. Uh, who I'm absolutely certain now would never, ever have um, got through any child protection, mm. uh, you know, s register or scrutiny. Mm. There were a number of, I'm afraid it was of that period, people didn't think of those things, they weren't alert mm. to it. Mm. But uh, luckily, A, I, that, I was not a pretty boy, but he taught me maths absolutely brilliantly. Mm. And, you know, I have, I taped my hat off to him. He used to do really things which you could do at much later ages. Mm. Mm. Um, and I used, when I was working in the Treasury, controlling half of public expenditure, and I would do a sort of basic bit of algebra, I would tip my hat to him and think, <laughs> I, he, I was taught to do this very well. Mm. So I'm really strong mm. on equations and quadratic mm. equations and mm. the angle on the hypotenuse is equal to the, the angle between tangent and chord is equal to the angle subtended by that chord in the alternate segment and all that <laughs> sort of Euclidean. <laughs> Geometry, uh, I, I th and I think 
he he was a good I, English teaching was I, I don't think I was taught that well um, uh, but I, I, it's a good a reasonably good grounding mm. though I, do, I think I don't really know what they taught me they kept me occupied mm. uh, I think held you a bit miserable I was I, most of the time. yes but on the other hand um, I developed a minor flair for th- acting I took the part of Shylock that was I think the highlight of my time there and I graduated to being a reasonably as deputy head boy um, so I didn't do badly but I didn't really I, I did find leaving home and being parted at the age of eight mm. extremely difficult to cope with mm. and I think but I think probably it did me a world of good but it wasn't much fun at the time <laughs> uh, and I should just say I mean it was an interesting school because the other person who's who, the person who's there um, who uh, uh, was a couple of years older than me was John Cleese, mm. uh, who at that time was extremely tall, very good boy too, a good cricketer, uh, who um, uh, showed no signs of the person, the man who emerged in comedy later on. Uh, I was this very solemn, serious, able prefect, and mm. I remember him breaking out. We were all rioting slightly, and him coming in. And my first Shakespeare because uh, Shakespeare is a very important part of my life. first Shakespeare I ever saw was a truncated version of Twelfth Night in which John Cleese, aged, I would guess, 10 or 11, played Malvolio. And I, I to this day, think the best Malvolio I saw was, it was Cleese at the age of 11 doing the mm. cross garter scene. And he, he, but the other thing about John Cleese was that um, whenever I see him, I think there's a day boy, because we had about 10 boys at school were day boys, and they were sort of, they were uh, different, they weren't quite, they didn't really belong, because they weren't... Day bugs, we call them. Yeah, that's right, exactly. And um, I always look at John Cleese and think, ah, but I know he's a day boy. And I still find it quite hard to see him as a comic character, because that wasn't how he was. Mm. And his parents, I believe, kept a hotel in Western Supermare. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, the seeds of faulty tyres were no doubt being laid at that time. Sorry, that's a digression. No, no, it's wonderful. Um, but we'll go on. You went on to Radley, is that right? Yes. We went, I was sent to Radley because my parents said to the headmaster um, of the school, um, where should we send him? And he said, we haven't sent anyone to Radley lately. Why don't you send him to Radley? <laughs> so that's where I went. Uh, mm. And we... Uh, and I went to Radley um, uh, in, oh, come on, October 1956, yeah. uh, September. I arrived late because I had been given a, um, a, a, a vaccination, a smallpox vaccination, just before I was due to go. And then the doctor looked at it and thought it hadn't taken, so he gave it to me again. And I was extremely ill, mm. so I arrived late. Um, and that was not as good, anything like as good a school as it is now. I'm chairman mm-hmm. of Radley now, yeah. Radley Council. But it was, uh, it was a school which, again, was, gave huge weight to athletics and to uh, sport, which I was no good at at all. Um, and I did then, but it did, have a, it did do rowing. Mm-hmm. And I learned to row, and I really loved rowing. I wasn't very good at it because I was not strong. I was the wrong shape. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was extremely light, but I used to go sculling on the Thames, and you could go off down the river, and it really was a very pleasant way of spending an afternoon mm. sculling. And I and I also rowed in boats, and I rather enjoyed that. Mm. There were big, t- heavy tubs, mm. and we used to have an awful struggle to get them to move at all fast. <laughs> um, but it was it was it was that was that was actually the only sport which I really took to and I wasn't mm. good at it but I got it's a sport anyone can do and I, mm. I'm a strong I'm president of the Emmanuel College Boat Club <laughs> and, I, and I sort of can identify with that I would have liked to have played other sports and been good at them but I do think that the lack of the poverty of eyesight was a considerable factor in that. Why do you think sport is such an obsession with these boarding schools at that time? Um, I it think because it brings formation? out I think it brings out qualities which are quite good for running an empire. Uh, I honestly think Mm. that's what it was about. I think I had a very good education to send me out to to a colony or to a part of of the empire. I think I was taught qualities of standing on your own, endurance, Mm. um, uh, um, leadership, uh, you know, not, uh, uh, and all sorts of things about uh, uprightness, probity, 
what a, what, what, what a chap does and what a chap doesn't do, which you never really so lose. Kipling, if stuff. I think it wasn't. For, I, it's what I'm trying to say, really, is that I think it was still. I was still caught in the early fifties and indeed the mid fifties. I think I still caught that kind of flavour of period. And I didn't, there were all sorts of things in a way which I missed out on. My parents never had a television, so I've never, I've never watched television much. Mm. I do watch it a bit occasionally, like the news mm. I watch. Mm. But it's, it's, it never, I, the first time I ever really watched a television was when the man, land, men landed on the moon. I rented a television because I wanted to watch it, landing on the moon. But when I was 26 or 27 mm. by then, mm. I don't know. Mm. So there, there were other boys at school who would talk about television jingles or the, mm. you know, Muffin the Mule or something, and I hadn't the foggiest notion what that was about. <laughs> and I, the music which I was brought up on, which was very middle brow, so I knew um, every Gilbert and Sullivan opera, the music, except for Radigal and Princess Ida, which I've never really learnt. But I knew that the words of them and the music of them absolutely backwards. Uh, which has always been useful. It's mm. full of quotations you mm. can use. It is. Um, uh, but I knew them, you know, I could quote you the Ricardo mm. or Patience or Iolanthe. Mm. Uh, and I can still probably do have a good shot at quoting to you. Mm. Um, and I love Iolanthe because it reminds me of the House of Lords. Still, it's, there's still lines in it which are relevant. <laughs> uh, Did you sing in it? And I've never sung in it, no. I'd mm. love to. I'd mm. love to have done. I used to do a certain amount of singing. Radley gave me an opportunity to do some singing. I had missed the choir test, so I never joined the choir. But I did have chances to sing. In. I, we sang, and notice we got saying the following will represent the college, you know, in singing Faust against St Mary's. That's not quite true, <laughs> but it was that kind of flavour. Mm. We would, um, uh, not Faust, um, uh, um, For His Requiem. Mm. Uh, and so I, I liked singing. But, mm. but Gilvan Sullivan was a very was a craze was a craze I had at about mm. the age of eleven. Mm. Whatever I could find that, that I could latch on to, I seized fairly hungrily. But you and you went on playing. What instrument do you play? I used to play the piano. I tried. I can play it now. But I've always had the problem that my brain can, knows what it wants to do, but my hands never quite keep up with what <laughs> I, my brain wants them to do. It never quite respond. Um, and, and musical comedies. I am a great living expert on musical comedies of the early 50s. I can do all of Annie Get Your Gun or mm. Brigadoon or Oklahoma or Call Me Madam or any of those because we used to go and see carbon mm. copies would come to the new theatre Cardiff and that would be a treat. We'd go and see mm. um, one of those. Mm. So it's very middle brow. Did you go on to more highbrow music later? Yes, I mean, you come to Cambridge and the whole world's open up in front of you. Because mm. uh, music, Radley, I, I learnt um, fairly orthodox things on the piano and nothing very advanced. Um, and, um, you know, you didn't have access to radio or there was one old gramophone uh, in the sort of house, house's library, but where, where I actually learned, you know, people were playing Elvis Presley and Buddy Holly, <laughs> and I was a bit shocked by those bits of music, but then I developed a taste for them later on, mm. and I discovered that actually pop music of the 60s was mm. fantastic. Mm. But um, it, I only really, I, I've, moved, I've, I've, I've moved to chamber music mm. uh, now, which I, I, in times of stress or trouble, um, very, I'm very orthodox, very, mm. very boring, but I just, a bit of, uh, of Schubert uh, or um, Beethoven's late quartets or mm. whatever, they, I find them hugely consoling or inspirational or whatever you want from them. Mm. So that's how you listen to music, I mean. I've got, if you want to see my music, I've got it on my <laughs> iPhone, I won't show it to you, but I carry with me. Mm. I've got my little headphones with me, but I actually like, I think, the ability to carry such mm. a huge library around in your pocket now. Mm. It's quite extraordinary. Mm. And that, that's, that I like very much. Though I also like Ella Fitzgerald, who I think singing is quite superb. And I think Frank Sinatra, and his good days, his good mm. period, which is about 52 to 1960, mm. is also very good. Mm. You have a pretty Catholic taste. A very Catholic, you? extremely, if you look at mm. it, it's very wide, mm. very Catholic taste. Mm. You're not going to Handel at the moment, are the Handel Fest at no. Cambridge, which is no. wonderful. wonderful. It's marvellous, is it? Marvellous, marvellous. Um, anyway, um, what about the acting? You said that um, I, the high point was when you were about 12, but did you go on doing it? I did acting at Radley, um, did a number, a number of productions. Uh, I, I produced a play, I acted in all sorts of things, which you do at schools like mm. Our Town, 
uh, Bernard Shaw's um, Caesar and Cleopatra um, school mm. play, you know, house plays or whatever. Um, and I got a lot of pleasure from that. When I came to Cambridge, this is moving again forward, mm. I um, did sign up and it was a period when there were the most extraordinary number of talented people who were um, wanting to go on the stage. Uh, so that I was in the Marlowe Society production of, of, of Macbeth by Trevor mm. Nunn, mm. Um, where uh, you know you had Richard Eyre and um, Miriam Margulies and John Grillo and um, Mike Pennington and all sorts of people who actually have established themselves as pretty good names. Mm. Uh, and I was a, I was a spear holder. It's my first <laughs> term. I still have the scar because they sharpened the knives, I think, on Trevor Nunn's in instruction. <laughs> and I had to go off and have two stitches in it because of the battle. So, and I, I was in, um, I, I think the best part I was in was the, was the, um, was it the Mummers, uh, Bartholomew Fair, which Richard Eyre produced, where I was a moon calf to Tim Brooke Taylor's um, uh, pig woman. Anyway, <laughs> so, I mean, but I gave that up after a while, because, mainly because, A, it took up far too much time, mm -hmm and B, because um, I realised that I wasn't that good and they were really terrific and, <laughs> I, and, and it was silly to, mm. c to go on competing. I wasn't really competing mm. at all. I was in doing it because it's fun. Mm. And it was a good thing to do because it gave, taught me to appear before an audience, which mm. when I became a permanent secretary and found I had to make speeches and do things in audiences, I drew on that experience to be able to stand up and, as it were, to perform in front of them. Mm. Um. Were there any masters at Radley who there was, had a strong influence on you? There was one master called Paul Croson, P.S. Croson, who is my housemaster, and he was hugely important for me, a really important father figure and a wise man, and a huge influence on me for life, really. Uh, and that was, he was, uh, you know, from 13 to 18, and I owe him a huge debt. And later in my career, there have been a number of occasions uh, when I have been aware that I have said things, e.g. both to Mrs. Thatcher and to Mr. Blair, which I learned, which I, where I was repeating things that Paul Croson had said. How it's do you spell his name? C-R-O-W-S-O-N. Yeah. And did he teach you any... any... He taught me English. Hmm. And, and he was also a historian, and he must have taught me a bit hmm. of it, history, but hmm. I may remember... But he, was, he was my housemaster... And um, he, was, he was a terrific figure in the school and extremely wise. And I think he'd had TB, so he was always a bit... Uh, and he spoke in a slightly funny manner. But he was, he was, for me, he was absolutely the person I needed at the time when I needed it. And he was a, a marvellous figure. Mm. Lovely. That's a very nice pic portrait. Is there anything else on your on Radley that you'd like to... I was well taught. I mean, the thing was, that, that the thing about Radley was that although I th used to think afterwards that I went through it under anaesthetic, a lot of my schooling, I just sort of closed myself down. Um, I think I was a lot brighter than they gave me credit for. Um, but uh, my family didn't, didn't really like people being clever. I remember being told, you're not clever, you just work hard. I came from a fairly anti-intellectual Back, mm. South Wales is not a place mm. to be clever in, uh, and I was not encouraged to be clever. Mm. Uh, and um, uh, so what I did was just get through um, uh, and get by, and that's and and to do the things that you learn to develop the little c comforts that you can, mm. and to, to endure the rest. Mm. The, and that sounds pretty grim, but I think that's what I did. Mm. Um, but and then the things which I enjoyed, which quite often were things of the intellect. I'd suddenly had a period when I got, I did very well, in, perfectly well in my O-levels. Uh, and then when I got to A-levels, I suddenly took off. And I returned, I'd, given, I'd slightly gone off reading because I couldn't find anyone to read when I was 14, 15. But I suddenly, I had a very good master who, who just said, if you want to buy this book, I'll buy it and you can, I'll put it on your parents' bill. So I read the whole of Evelyn War and a huge amount of Thomas Hardy and the whole sort of new... I suddenly graduated to grown-up books mm. in a different way. Mm. Um, and that was... And then I suddenly... I did classics. I threw over science, which I regret sometimes. And I did classics. I did Latin A-level in one year. Uh, and then I did English history and French. And it was marvellously... I suddenly connected with myself. And it was huge, probably the most creative, liberating 
I mean, I did quite a lot of acting at school, and it was, a, and we started, I found some friends, and we started a, a magazine, and a school magazine, uh, and I wrote under the name of Apollo, goodness knows why. <laughs> Was it Apollo? Uh, uh, and um, and I and I had a, it was it was just a period of about for eighteen months, um, and I came up to Cambridge um, to take a, a scholarship exam. They put me in, not think. And I remember Paul Croson saying, "You should do the scholarship exam. You won't get one, but uh, they may offer you a place." So I came up to Cambridge. I was leaving the school. My father had run out of the money, so I was leaving the school in December nineteen sixty. And I came up to Cambridge to take the scholarship exam, and I can remember arriving. I'd never been to Cambridge, and why Cambridge? Because he put said we, should, we haven't sent anyone to Clare lately. <laughs> you know, this has been the story of my life. So I came, so I came. He put me down for Clare, and he also put me down for Worcester College, Oxford, if which I, is where I went. Which is, and um, I came up, and I brought all my books with me in a bag, in a suitcase, which I packed every textbook I wanted and tons of things I didn't need. And I remember taking a taxi, because my mother had given me the money for the taxi from the train to Clare, gave the Porter's Lodge, and they said, you're in Memorial Court, and dragging this huge suitcase all the way along the path to Memorial Court. But the excitement for me of taking that exam was just phenomenal. I had no idea that anywhere could be as beautiful or as exciting as Cambridge. I had a few other friends taking exams at the same time, and we, we went out, and the taste of freedom and the excitement of being here, I just fell in love with the place and I haven't really ever not fallen, you know, I've never fallen out. Mm. It, was, it was a very deep imprint or something which took immediately. And I remember seeing Levis, this old man in a Mac with not apparently wearing <laughs> a shirt because we took our exams mm. in Downing because uh, we were in that group. And Levis, and I was so excited at seeing Levis. It was just super because I'd read all the mm. Common Pursuit, I'd read all his books, mm. uh, and they gave me an exhibition, which is really nice of them. And I, I remember the telegram arriving. Mm. Uh, from, it was a telegram, mm. and my mother was making a Christmas pudding, and this telegram arrived somewhere around the 18th of December. I've still got it, <laughs> saying you've been, we would like to offer you an exhibition at, at, at Clare College, and it was just, and the school was astonished, absolutely astonished. <laughs> Um, and um, that was, I think, superb. Mm. I think Cambridge is hugely important to me mm. because I'd already connected with myself in, mm. in some way, which was very creative. And I hadn't the foggiest notion why or what was going on. Mm. But I, and then I came to Cambridge, and it was just allowed me to do all to grow all those bits mm. of me which I had suppressed through mm. the previous eighteen years. Mm. And I was, and it was totally undisciplined. But I had people here who were like me who I could make mm. friends with, so I, and I could do, it was a sort of revelation for me, uh, that the world could be actually as good as this. Mm. And I'm very grateful, I'm very grateful indeed. Mm. That's lovely, a very nice tribute to it. Um, so you read English? I read law. I mean, yeah. that, was a, that was a silly thing, really. A great <laughs> debate broke out, you can't read English, it's not useful. And I was too weak or too, you know, shy. And my parents said, "You must read law. You're going to be a solicitor." Mm. So um, I read law, and it was it's a good subject, law, and I did perfectly well in it. But it didn't have the kind of excitement which really, if I'd actually had the strength or the encouragement, I would have done. I'd have read English and or history it was actually, and I really history is really where I think I'd have, I, I mm. wish is, is the subject I wish I'd read. I don't, I don't want to sound ungrateful, because mm. law was a really good discipline for me for the rest of my career, and it served me very well in all sorts of ways. And I, I again was taught by someone who is another very important figure in my life, a man called Bill Wedderburn, who is a mm. fellow of Director of Studies in Law at Clare. And he was a huge influence on me, again. I was, I'm very lucky with the father figures who mm. I accumulated through my... Mm. Uh, through that period when you need mm. them. Mm. And Bill Wedderburn, uh, who I became his research assistant. And when I, I did a BA and I did an LLB, as it then was, LLM now. And after that, I wanted to go to the bar, or at least I thought I did. And so I spent a year as his research assistant at LSE. He'd gone off to be the Castle mm. Professor of Law at LSE. And as his research assistant for a year. Mm. So he's another important figure. Why, why was he so important, apart from being an older man? And oh, because, because, he, oh well, because he was very left-wing. And he, challenged, he did all the things which I wanted to do, really, which is to ask questions. I remember horrifying my mother by saying, does the family have a future? Why should we all live in families? 
which is quite a good rebellious question to this ask your own mother. Edmund Leach's famous Sorry? Reith lectures um, yes. talks about this around this time. This, uh, yeah, and it was... And I used to, mm. the, that's exactly right. Mm. So I was... And Bill, Bill Wedderburn was sort of himself um, very radical. And it was, it, was, it was what I needed, was someone who was prepared to debate without sort of all the constraints of the pretty tight... Um, middle-class upbringing which I'd had. Hmm. Did you have any contemporaries who you became very close friends with or can have retained? Yes, we, there was a group of us, mainly lawyers, but also um, classicists or one or two others. And we still meet once a year or thereabouts and occasionally, you know, we do things like go to the opera or something together. Hmm. And we had them, or some of them, to, to um, lunch with their wives uh, a few weeks ago. So mm. the answer is yes. Mm. It's, it is a very, it's a very strong bond. And although, and we, the, the nice thing about them is you pick it up, pick things up with them, however much mm. you see them or don't see them, as soon as you mm. see them, and there's a, I'm having a drink next week with, a, with, with someone I was mm. Claire with. So the answer is yes. Mm. Um, you mentioned your father being on the fringes of the church, mm. and Wales is a fairly well-known place for this sort of thing. And um, around the time of between school and university or that time is often the time you either take to religion or leave your religious faith. Um, what, what has been your... My, my religion was... Um, I was, went through... Very, I mean, I was very religious for a period. Um, first of all, at my prep school. There was something called the English Speaking Union, not the English Speaking, mm. the English Scripture Union. Was scripture it? Union. And they had a little badge, a green, mm. an emerald green badge with a little lamp in the middle mm. and readings, and they'd send you these things. And I, mm. you know, and that was so exciting. I joined, <laughs> joined up because it was a, this exciting letter with this package of, of things, uh, and that didn't really take. And then I, Radley, which is, um, I came to love chapel. I uh, um, because it was all the things which you don't have now, which is like the common prayer book. Mm. And I liked the atmosphere in chapel. It was a, it was a relief with those years of anaesthesia. Mm. It was a place where you could actually have a few moments of privacy, which you didn't mm. on the whole have all the time, much privacy, um, and uh, with your own thoughts. And I quite liked a lot of that. And Paul Croson was very religious. So, and he, and so I, I was... And, um, you were confirmed, presumably. I was confirmed, yes. Mm. Um, and then... Um, I think when things kicked in, as it's sort of, I can't remember, I think of the age, 16, 17, I suddenly went off religion. And when I started being radical, came up to Cambridge, I, I shed it gleefully. It was all part of that rebellion. Mm. I did have a very strong rebellion reaction against my upbringing mm. uh, for a period. Were you um, hippie? No, not I. No, I was actually. I remained. I remained extremely sort of. Um, uh, no, no. It was my. I say strong reaction. It's strong to me, but in terms of the mm-hmm. outside world, it was extremely much. Didn't extremely wear a duffel coat and have I, a CND badge. No, I didn't have a C. I remember talking to my cousin about being. No, I remember. I remember wearing jeans. I bought a pair of jeans and I walked down through Kings. <laughs> with my first pair of jeans, and I wore them home. And my father took me aside and said. I don't like you see you wearing those. If you're short of money, you must let me know. <laughs> Which had absolutely crushed it, you know. So that was for me was rebellion, was wearing a pair of jeans. It is, it is pathetic, I do know that. But that's, it, the, the 60s did not begin mm. until 63. I mean, mm, um, and yeah. for me, that was absolutely true. Mm. Um, and then, of course, the other thing which happened to me in... The week Kennedy was assassinated, uh, I met my wife to be, um, mm. and that was probably the most important thing that could happen to me ever, you mm. know, in my life, uh, mm. was meeting Caro. Um, she was in her sixth week, poor lamb, which I know, um, of, of, at Newnham, and I was in my uh, third year, beginning my first time of my third year, and um, we met at a party in Corpus, in Old Court, um, and that was very, very important, I, you know, for all sorts of obvious reasons. And um, we took a long time to get around to getting married, but we got married in 72, and um, we've been together, and she's still now the most crucial figure, she and our children, mm. the most important people in my life. Um, mm. You know, and I'm, I'm, I, the story that I, after this slightly, I don't know what flavor I've given you of my childhood, but I think from, from about the age of 16, 17 onwards, I think I, the message I'd want to convey, because I feel it, is that I'm a hugely lucky man. Mm. I have had a blessed life. 
Mm. Um, and the investment my father made, although I didn't get on with him, if I'm honest, at all, because he was a very withdrawn, pretty cold figure. But the investment he made in my education was the most was was what gave me the break, uh, the freedom. It was a lucky break, and it altered, And that was and I and I owe my parents a lot for that because they didn't have any money. They were not rich at all. Otherwise, and they, in their old age, they were pretty pretty through pretty. Um, it was pretty tough, um, but they they gave me that, and it and it was the kind of social leg up, and I seized it. Mm. I suddenly seized it when I was sixteen or seventeen, won a place at Cambridge, and then everything followed from that. Mm. Tell me a little more about. Was it Karen? Caro. See, uh, she's Caro uh, Caroline. Oh, I see. Caroline Lee. Uh, first four letters of her name, Caro. She's always been known mm. as. Um, she read English. Uh, she got first, um, uh, and she um, what. And um, love it a bit, but I, what do you want me to tell her about it? Well, did she go on to an independent career? Yes, or? no, she, was, she had her own bid for independence. She, um, she didn't want to settle down and get married uh, when we left Cambridge, when I left, because I'd left before her, obviously. So she went off to Nigeria on VSO and was thrown out, uh, poor thing, when, uh, when uh, the Civil War broke out mm. there. Uh, and didn't want to come home and try to just denounce her British nationality. She could stay with Africa. She's loved Africa all her life. Mm. Um, and then she came back and she was a teacher. Uh, and she became a teacher in a college uh, of FE, Latin College of FE. She taught English at A-level there. Um, and, uh, and, um, and she gave up that job when she was in 1976. Uh, so she was a teacher for eight years. and. Uh, we started a family in 70, oh come on, 79, our son mm. was born, mm. March 79. Mm. Uh, do you want me to move on to there or should, do you want, mm. there's a whole chunk of important stuff. But, and, the, and the thing which I also ought to say was that she, when, after we'd been going out a bit, she broke to me the news that her father was master of corpus, which came as a shock to me uh, and, and it wasn't a wholly welcome one uh, at all. Um, it didn't fit in with quite... I didn't sort. Of, I had sort of expected it, and I was very reluctant to meet them really. Um, and but her mother, who's a lovely lady, I mean, I love her to bits. Uh, and now uh, she died five years ago, six years ago, five years ago. But um, uh, but she, they, they engineered. It was a, a, a meeting, uh, and, and then I and then I became very fond of her parents. Her father was had been. A civil servant. Uh, he had worked with Maynard Keynes in Washington uh, in, during and uh, the, after the war in the great, very close to Keynes. He's written some marvellous letters about it, which I've got in, in, in the lodge. Uh, and he was a lovely man. Uh, and, uh, and Kathleen was a marvellous woman. And so th they became an important influence on me. And Carrie had sisters who were great friends. And um, uh, when I was, I was thinking of going to the bar, and I went to the bar, I took the exams, and I sang with Bill Wedderburn. But um, I suddenly realised I hadn't got any money. I actually hadn't got a bean. I mean, you know, I, nothing. And you needed a private income to go. You had to pay for your articles, and you had to keep yourself, maintain yourself. And I didn't see how I was going to do it. And uh, Frank Lee one day said to me, have you ever thought of entering the civil service? And I'd actually been very impressed by the train of civil servants uh, who had um, gone through uh, corpus, who I'd met in, you know, intermittently, people like Richard Powell, Permanent Secretary of the Board of Trade, um, uh, and, and, you know, famous mm. uh, William Armstrong, mm -hmm. who was at that time was a rising star, and uh, what's her name, you know, the, uh, um, not Sharples, what, uh, the, uh, in, uh, dear, can't do the... Um, Great friend of his, permanent secretary of the Ministry of Housing and Local, Sharp, Dame mm. Evelyn Sharp. Mm. Uh, I met her, and I liked these people. I thought they were their talk was interesting, they're, and I I thought they they were people who I took to, and I thought well, and they, I suppose I picked up a sense of the civil service, which I found very attractive, um, and I suddenly thought well, why don't I take the exam? And I took the exam, and I got in. I got it. Came in second in the in the. You know, they used to do it in the competition. This is the home civil service. The home civil service, yeah. yes. I enjoyed the exams. I didn't enjoy the written bit. 
but I enjoy the all the tests and interviews you have to do. You do have to do all this sort of a week, uh, a few days. That's it. Yes. The country house. It wasn't the country house. It was actually the Savile Road when I did it. But it was <laughs> mm. <laughs> not far off. It was mm. still the mm. child of that mm. test, uh, and you had to do, share things. And I found I took to like a duck to water, really. Mm. Um, and I was put in the board of trade as an assistant principal, which I joined on the 5th of September 1966. Um, and I was put into a job to do with trade with South Africa, which is during the Kennedy round. And I wasn't particularly happy at that time because Carol was in Africa and I was missing her. So actually that was, that was bad. And I also got mumps, which is dreadful. But um, after a while, I then moved on to consumer protection where we had a bill going through parliament. And everyone was ill at Christmas and I did a, something, I took over, took control of a bit of drafting of the bill that had defeated everybody, which is about the price comparison. If you, in a shop, and you mm. advertise that something's mm. been reduced in price, mm. um, how do you, and, and it's false, we wanted to get at that. And so I, I think I can claim, invented the, the law, which is still the law, that you have to have sold it at that price for, for, for 28 days beforehand. It's section 11 or clause 11 of the Trade Descriptions Act 1968, as it was. Uh, and it, I got it through. And then I suddenly, and I think I took off then. And honestly, the civil service for the next 35 years, 36 years, gave me a succession of jobs, all of which completely stretched me, took me, I, every one I took, I thought, I can't possibly do this, and found that I could. And they never stopped doing it, and I loved it. I had the most interesting possible career anyone could have, and I was lucky at every step. Mm -hmm. I was lucky in meeting Caro. I was lucky in getting an exhibition to Claire. I was lucky in meeting Caro. I was lucky in getting into the civil service. I was lucky in all the jobs I had. I had a succession of jobs, all of which were quite superb. I became a private secretary. Is this helpful? Yes, yes. I became a private. I don't want you to skip over it too quickly. That's okay. okay. Well, I will slow down. You can ask me a question. I will. Well, I, I just want to finish off one earlier thread, which was yeah. religion. Oh yes. Oh, I found um, religion because you basically yes. escaped from it when you came yes. to Cambridge. But did you ever revert to it at all, or what is your position on religion? Position. Yeah. Oh, dear me, I wonder if the Dean is going to see this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're in good company, almost every person I've been. Uh, I think I, um, I decided when, when I came to, I, I think I, I, we used to go, to, we used to take our children, we made sure our children knew about religion and gave them the choice. We were very sort of typical in that. And I, we, we had moved, we moved to a small village in Buckinghamshire, which I'll come to in 1978 when we started our family. And um, we used to go occasionally to church and, and had nat nativity plays, what our son calls, used to call nativity plays. <laughs> um, uh, and, um, but I didn't really go to church much. Uh, and I've always had difficulty, I, even under Paul Croson's tuition, I had difficulty with what we used to call Holy Communion. I don't, can't put my finger on it, I never quite understood that, but I did have difficulty with it. And I was also struck by the fact that my dear father, who had gone, all, done all this for the church in Wales, lost his faith quite clearly in his, in his later years. I think he watched the bishops arguing. He had a terrible heart attack when he was younger than me. Uh, and when asked why he'd had a heart attack, he said he was just seeing the bishops arguing uh, so much among themselves. He couldn't, and he was very disillusioned by the church. And I think he stopped, he didn't go much. I think he lost his faith, really. He, didn't, he never talked about these things, so I'm only guessing. Mm. He didn't believe in talking about any of the things that were interesting in life, namely sex, politics, and religion. <laughs> were all subjects which are completely, completely not allowed to be talked about. And um, so, but then come, came to Emmanuel. Um, I'd always thought to myself, well, there's a time later in life when I'll, I'll think about religion. And um, I came to Emmanuel, and I said to the dean, now how can I help you? Cause, mm -hmm. And he said, it'd be very helpful if you'd come to chapel. So I thought, okay, Evensong, that's all right. And I, and I do go to Evensong every Sunday. And all the things which I liked about chapel at Radley, or well, quite a lot of them, come back to me at Emmanuel. And I like going on a Sunday at six, because I like the singing, and I like a lot of... Well, I do regret the way the Church of England has developed. <laughs> And I had a very good talk the other evening with Assistant Chaplain about, who explained to me what had happened. So whereas when I went to church, as it were, as a child, as, and as a, 
as a, as a, as a schoolboy. It was it was the um, English establishment, you know, uh, mm. social. It was, it was part of the social structure, and it's built around the common prayer book, which I loved, a book of common prayer, which I loved and still love the language and the and the uh, and the uh, James Bible, um, mm. which I think is marvellous. I find I do not, I have not taken to the way that uh, the, the, the services have developed or the use of the what I of the of the. Um, of, of, of modern translations of the Bible, but I re always follow it in my my own copy of the Bible because I, mean, I compare them and I think that was better. Mm. It was clearer and it, actually the language you, know, you can see occasionally they've corrected an error. Mm. But I, so I, so that where I am now in religion is that I I will support. I also think it's not bad. It's a force for good. I think the choir in chapel is a nice little community, and I think it's a force for good in the college community. And there are people for whom it meets a need and. I, I, and I've had to cope with death quite a lot, you know, as one does, as people die. And you do grieve for people, and you do wonder about life afterwards. Um, and I end up with a pretty agnostic position, if I'm honest. Yes, yes and I was going to say that you had not mentioned God at all in any of this, so presumably it's the beauty of holiness stuff that you like. The, the yes, I also holiness. quite, I, I find, when listening to the New Testament, I do find... Um, Jesus Christ, a really interesting person. I think he. I think a lot of the incidents that take place, you know, the excitement around him when he first came on the scene, which I'd never mm. noticed before, uh, is, is really very graphic. It's like a new political figure, mm. and um, and I do think he's. I do think the picture of him is really interesting, and I. And if I turn out to be wrong, and it's and it, there is an afterlife. Then you know I shall say I should think well I'm very glad I think he was a very important interesting man. I think I mean you're a pretty you're, trivial approach I'm afraid, but it's very hard to, not to view religion. You're an anthropologist mm -hmm. as an anthropological mm -hmm. um, uh, development in, mm -hmm. in mankind, rather than it's very hard to to, to quite square it all. Mm -hmm. And I have very diff great difficulty with St Paul and all those letters. You've had a, I mean, your college has had some very interesting religious associations in the last 20 years. Yes, Don Cupid. Uh, Don Cupid, who yes. I've interviewed, I don't know if you've oh, seen I didn't need to interview Don. Yes, yes, and um, also you had a Catholic master, didn't you? Yes, you did, Norman Simpson of Forsley, with whom I'm still in contact. Yeah. So it's sort of weird, which is very interesting. It um, is interesting. 